cost to the environment. And, you know, it, it's all done in one place. The treated water, so you can see here, houses to the sewer system, back out here, the facility into the water. Uh, or, or there's other ways of doing it, but generally it goes into a waterway. When we talk about rural water, uh, we, wanted, we, we need to treat our, our waste in our homes. Um, so we do it right on site. Um, the, the, say, we say that it's rendered harmless. I mean, it's still not 100%. You don't want to take a glass of it and drink it by any means, but it's, it's taken most of the uh, contaminants out. And, and we're really as well. And it's done a little differently than we do in, in, a, in a treatment plant and on a smaller scale. So if we look here, uh, septic, obviously we're, we have our waistline in blue here coming out to our septic tank. What that is going to do is going to remove some of the, it's going to have some settlement, uh, decomposition, uh, and then from there the, the water or the, the, the water will come out to your, your, your field bed. And from there it's going to either drain down through the soil or it's going to evaporate up through the soil. So there's two ways that our water is taken care of there. Um, and, you know, it can get down into the groundwater as well. That's why it's important that it's running well. Um, what is a septic system? I mean, it's an on-treat system to, to, to treat our wastewater in our home. It's a subsurface because it's underground. It is basically the same system you would use in the city system. There are some differences and, you know, instead of, there's so many different types of septic systems. We're going to talk about the basics. Um, but the process is very similar to what we would have to process our city waste. The components consist of our tank. We have a drainage or leaching field and we'll have a distribution or drop box. And as we go here through here, we'll show you those components and how they make it work successfully. So septic tank is your settlement tank. There's where all your solids go and they separate from liquids, uh, your solids tank, your, your greases, your oils, those types of things will float to the top and we refer that as your scum layer. Uh, we don't want the solids or the grease and oils going into our drainage field. That's where the problems start coming in. Um, if we start sending solids and grease and oils out to the drainage field, then it's gonna start plugging the, the drainage system and we're gonna have a bad. And we'll show you a little more about this as we go through with some diagrams. Some of the solids in the tank are going to decompose and, and they will and it ends up back into the liquid layer. So when we look through the actual, we, we look through the actual tank itself, our wastewater is coming in and it's going into this liquid layer. Anything that's, that's lighter than water will float to the top and would be called your scum layer. And anything that's, that would be your solids is going to go down to your sludge layer. Why that's important uh, to know is, you know, if we let this scum layer get too big, guess what? Our water's our drain field through the bottom of this. And if we get too much, the scum layer gets too thick or the sludge layer gets too thick, then we're starting to push that through. The other thing with, a, with, a, um, with this type of system, if we, if we run too much water for too long, it doesn't have time to do its job. Most of the tanks have a baffle in the center as well. Uh, so you, you'll, you'll end up with, with a, a little, uh, not a, it's not a huge baffle, but it'll end up so that you get a little more clarity on the out, outgoing side of the tank. On the top, you're gonna have your, sorry, your access uh, hatches here, and that's what they're gonna use to clean them out. Um, and they're generally made out of concrete. Generally now they're recommending that a riser be put on here so it's easier to get in and clean them. So the drainage field, and we refer to that as a drainage or leaching field. It's going to take all the lip uh, and, and it's going to let them drain into the ground or they can evaporate up through the soil. The pipes that are buried under the ground are perforated. They have small holes in them. Um, they're they're, they're in, a, in a layer of gravel and underneath that is generally they'll put in a sand so that we have room for the, the water to filter down through the sand. So looking here, we have a septic tank. From the septic tank, we go into our drop box, or, or sorry, home here, septic tank here with your two lids, and then we go to a distribution box. And from there, you can run, this one has uh, five 
uh, runs. Generally, you'll see between three and four, depending on the size of the house and the number of bathrooms. You'll see three to four lines going out, and each line is approximately 60 feet, 66 feet in length. Um, and the, the pipe itself is a four inch uh, uh, which is like a black drainage pipe with small slits in it for the water to drain out. And those slits are, are small for a reason because we don't want um, bugs getting in there. We don't want uh, sand getting in or gravel or dirt washing in. So it's important that those slits are small. But the downfall is because the slits are small, they can plug up if the septic system is not running properly. A very important part is the septic tank, but more important is the drainage field. Let's look a little more at the pipes here. You can see here sort of the stratified layers that you would find. You have your grass on the top and your soil, and then you have a layer of gravel, and embedded in the gravel is your perforated pipe. And they say soil here, but it's generally a, a free flowing or sandy, loamy type soil. Um, clay soils and whatnot will require bringing in extra sand in order for this to drain and perform properly. Sometimes you'll see a raised bed in the, uh, at the home where your septic tank will be a little lower and they'll pump up in. And that's because the soil there doesn't drain as well. So we had to send that up so that it'll, it'll have enough, we can add enough um, of a drainage layer underneath them so that the pipes don't back up. Process is a little different than in a uh, sewage treatment. In a sewage treatment plant, the, the disinfectant is generally, you'll treat it with a, 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 some sort of a biocide. Either it could be uh, sodium hypochlorite or bleach, and there's other things that can be used. In, in this, effluent is filtered down through the soil. The microbes in the soil are actually consuming any of the organics, and that actually does the, 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 uh, the disinfection. It does join the grain, groundwater eventually, um, but that could take, you know, depending on the groundwater level, could take years for that water to get down there. Um, so, you know, the, but the, the big part is the sanitation or disinfecting of it is done uh, biologically, it's done naturally. There's no extra uh, uh, microbes added to the soil. It's just whatever's there is consuming any of the organics and the, and the organisms, uh, the, the virus. So we've got, we've got, we went through the system here. We have, we have, uh, you know, a nice, nice septic system in the house. Uh, we're using it. Uh, we're, we're making sure we're not flushing things down that shouldn't be down there. And what happens? We do have to clean the tank. And that's the biggest question we get asked. How often should we clean the tank? Uh, why do we need to clean the tank? And the reason we, why we need to clean it is the solids that settle to the bottom, uh, um, there are, 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 you know, waste products that just don't decompose. Organics will decompose to a certain amount. They take a long time sometimes, but any inorganics that end up in there will actually take a little longer. And that sludge layer will build up over time. And if we don't pump it out, we're going to end up sending uh, the, the sludge or the solids out to the field bed, which is going to cause it to fail. Um, so you have to pump it out. Um, the other, the other reason you'd pump it out is if the sludge layer gets too thick. So, you know, in the city, a lot of times we'll take, uh, you know, we'll fry some bacon, everybody loves bacon. So fry some bacon and, you know, a lot of people pour it down the drain, a little bit of oil and whatnot on a septic system that's can really cause some issues if it's done too much. Um, you know, we get enough fats and oils from, from our own, uh, waste products and from showering and all that kind of stuff that we don't want to introduce extras. Uh, so that's one thing that's very important because once that scum layer gets up there and it gets too thick and we start getting greases and oils out to there, when it starts to cool off, they congeal. And then you end up with a, you know, a, a, the inside of the pipe being coated and then it doesn't drain. Uh, and the only way to clean that out is chemically or with uh, high pressure hoses, which can be very expensive as well. How often do we need to do that? Well, that would depend on the size of the tank, the number of people in the house, how careful people are at, with the system, how much junk goes down the drain. But generally, at least every three years. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for, a, for, a, for most houses with you know, three to four occupants, it's going to be every three to five years. Uh, and, but it, it will depend on the size of the tank. So a smaller tank would be about 500 gallons. If you had a 500-gallon tank, 
with two people in the house, it's about every two and a half years. If you had four people in that house with a five gallon, 500 gallon tank, you'd want to do it every one to two years as well. Uh, but you know, realistically, these 500 gallon tanks that were put in years ago, they're too small. Um, and, and that will be something that's, that's determined, you know, when, when the uh, septic system's inspected and pumped. If you were installing uh, a septic tank today, they say many areas, most uh, won't allow you to use a tank this small um, because it's just undersized. You cannot get it to settle properly and you end up with, with uh, backups and issues. Um, so we don't want to use tanks that small. If we have a larger tank, the thousand gallon, two people in a house every six years. If there's four people in the house, about every two and a half years. So, you know, it really depends on size and the amount of people in the house. Now, I would say if you had, you know, two people in the house that were home every day, all day, you're probably going to jump that down to, you know, every, every three to four years. But people who are generally leaving the house to work, you know, you can get away with every six years. Six years is a limit, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, it's a little bit too long, but uh, because things can happen and you don't know what's going on in that tank because you can't look in it on a regular basis. Or, sorry, you can but most people wouldn't look in it on a regular basis. There are some maintenance things to do with the, the uh, septic system. You know, your regular pumping is one thing. A regular inspection, ideally every year, it's good to have the lids taken off and look in and see what's going on. Most people aren't going to do that. Uh, not using uh, a garburetor. Garburetors put more solids in than we need. You're, you're grinding up your, your vegetables and your meats and all that stuff and sending it out. That's going to cause, you know, uh, the, the, the tank to have to be pumped sooner. And it can actually upset the tank because it's not designed to take that raw, raw material like that. You want to limit your grease and oils like we talked about. Um, you know, cooking bacon, pour it in a jar and throw it out or use it for cooking later. Don't flush it down the drain. Um, reduce your water usage. You know, those, those in the city, the three hour shower is fine. In the country, you want to reduce it a little bit because more water through there doesn't allow it to settle properly. And you're going to get some of those solids heading out to the field bed. Another thing that, I, one of the things I use uh, to, to explain to people and uh, you know, when you have a septic system, really the rule of thumb should be, if it doesn't come out of you, it doesn't go down there. So things you don't want to put in there, obviously, are paper towels. Paper towels don't break down fast enough. And funny enough, Costco toilet paper, uh, a lot of it doesn't break down fast enough. Things like coffee grounds, they don't decompose. Obviously, cigarette butts don't decompose. And why would we think chemicals? Why would a chemical matter? Well, chemicals can actually kill the bacteria that's doing the job in the tank. Um, anything that won't decompose quickly, no sanitary, uh, no sanitary items. Uh, no prophylactics, no, that's, that's one thing that I, I can't stress enough. Flushable wipes are not flushable anywhere. They say they're flushable and just because something can go down doesn't mean it should. Even in the city, they can cause a lot of issues and the number one cause of sewer backups and issues are wipes. Um, they just don't decompose. They, they, they look like they're made out of paper, but they're not. They really take a long time to decompose and they, they cause issues. How do we look after our drainage field? Well, on the drainage field, we don't want to plant trees because trees, obviously the roots want water. And if we're putting water out there, then they're going to want to feed off that, which is, you know, you think, hey, well, we can water our plants. It's a good thing to do. Unfortunately, those roots will grow and pack right into the, the pipes. And then you end up, you know, having to replace the drainage field. Uh, you want to have you don't want to have low spots in your in your drainage field. You don't want extra water pooling and draining down in there because then you're you're saturating the soil to where that where you want it to do is drain, but it can't anymore because it's it's saturated and it can also start running back through the system if it's bad enough. You want to keep heavy traffic off them, so you don't want to be driving trucks and cars over your or your drainage field. It can cause compaction. Uh, you can damage the the uh, the tiles. They're not that far under the ground. Sometimes they're you know 12, 16 inches under the ground. So we don't want anything heavy on there. The uh, prime example I've seen a few times: people will build a, a, a part of their garage over the drainage field, which is bad. Put a pool out there, like one of those above ground pools for the kids. Really, really bad for that. And if that ever 
you know, if there was ever an issue with that pool and it, and it sprung a big leak, we're going to have some issues there as well. So nothing, oh, sorry, nothing on top of the, of the drain field um, other than grass. That's all you want there. Um, sorry, just bear with me one second here. So with the system, you know, we, we, we want to keep everything off it. We want to make sure we're putting things down there that are, are not going to cause it to be, to, to upset. Um, now, one, I, I, and I hear this a lot. One of the things that comes up a lot, it was, you know, oh, we got to feed the, the septic system. A properly ma maintained and a properly running septic system does not need additional uh, chemicals or anything like that in it. It just doesn't need it. But there are some freeze-dried bacteria and things you can put down there. Uh, there's a lot of old wives' tales, you know, flush your mice, flush mice down there when you catch them. Throw, throw half a chicken in there. Uh, I mean, yes, that does add bacteria. Uh, the freeze-dried would be about the only thing that I would recommend. Uh, freeze-dried bacteria that's specifically designed for septic systems, like a septobac or something like that, that can actually help grow a, a more healthy environment for the bacteria. Um, and, and can help to, you know, uh, some of those solids to decompose a little better. But it's, if it's running right and you're looking after it and you're pumping it on a regular basis, you probably don't need any additional treatment. So the tanks sometimes need to be replaced, right? Uh, why do we want to replace a tank? Uh, it can be too small. It's obsolete. It's damaged. Um, some of them do get, they crack. They're made out of concrete, a lot of the older ones. Um, some of the components you can repair, the baffles. Um, those types of things can be repaired. There's, there's filters on them uh, that, can be, that can be cleaned and, and looked after as well. But you know, when the tank needs to be replaced, it's generally from damaged uh, or, or if it doesn't meet the requirements of a home. So you think, well, why, if I had a, a tank put in and the house is there, why would I ever have to worry about the size of the tank? So actually, you know, that would be a... What about the fact that this house only had two people in it? Now you're moving a family of six in there that's the tank is now too small to handle that. If we add an extra laboratory in there or a bathroom, that is going to be, the septic tank is designed for a certain number of things to get in it. And if we have more, more water going in, you know, it's going to be too small. And, you know, additions on houses, uh, when we, when you start adding to a house, that's when, you know, the tanks need to be replaced. For the drainage field, why would we have to replace the drainage field when it doesn't drain anymore? When the soil cannot absorb the effluent from the oils and greases getting in the soil, some of the solids getting in there that are just not being able to decompose. We have damage to it from crushed pipes, from driving a, a, you know, a dump truck across it. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you go from a two-person house to a six-person house, sometimes you, without draining that tank and letting it you know, start from new, um, that can cause it to upset and you're putting a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, waste out there. But it also could be that the, the system is actually on its way out and those, those drainage pipes are actually done. They're, they're plugged, they're ready to be changed, but they're getting away from it with two people in the house because there's not a lot of water going out there. As soon as you start taking it to the max capacity, it's going to start uh, failing. The other time you're gonna to wanna to replace it is when you have what we call effluent breaking out. When it starts to get wet, the grass is wet to walk on and squishy, then your drainage field is done. That's one of the simplest things to do for, a, um, for, for te testing a drainage bed is to you know, run water for a couple of hours and then go walk the drainage bed. If it is at the end of its life, you will have moisture out there. Um, there's other techniques that can be used using thermal cameras, that type of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, when we start seeing moisture, it's done. Let's just have a look. Um, so looking here, this is just the top of the tank. Um, this one is fairly clean, but you can see this is the baffle here. So your, your water is actually coming in this way. And instead of this is open just in case we get too much water. Uh, but the level in that tank should remain consistent. It should never be full and then, uh, you know, two inches lower and full and two inches lower. If you're seeing that, you're, you're either dumping large quantities very quickly into that tank, which is not good for it, but generally that indicates that it's starting to plug out. So if we look at another picture in here, this is what you're looking at here. This is your intake baffle. It's sealed around here so that the water coming in, you can see the tank is concrete. 
It's a two-piece tank. Um, there's a tank on the inlet and there's a tank on the outlet. So in this particular tank, we're going to look on the other side here. This is just done with a camera. So you can see the other side as well. If you look on top, there is, there is a, an access hole here. This just kind of shows you what the scum layer kind of looks like here. When the tank is, 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 when we plant things over tanks, when we don't look after them, they start to crack and we can allow vegetation to grow down in. This is what happens. You can see, it's, I know it's not the greatest picture and I do apologize for that. There's a couple of things going here. The baffle is actually damaged. It's not sitting right. So if that's not sitting right, it's, not, it's, it's allowing uh, improper mixing of the, the, the layers. So we can end up upsetting the system here. But look at all these roots that are growing in. That's telling us that this is nearing the end of its life. And these roots want this water because it has a lot of nutrients in it to grow. So when we talk about a septic system, what are the warning signs that we have that, you know, the system is, is, is nearing the end of its life? Well, the first thing would be odors. When we can go outside and we can smell sewage in the yard, that's probably a good sign. When we have those wet spots in the drainage field, that's a good sign. Um, and we say wet spot sewage surfacing in some areas, that is a really bad sign, but that's usually the tank itself is starting to back up. Most of the time when you have an issue with the septic system, it's gonna start backing up into the home um, because there, you, that's the first place you're gonna see it, especially if you have you know, a basement with septic pumps and whatnot, it's gonna back right up into there. So summary on septics, we have a septic tank, we have a drainage field. Those are the really the two main components of it. The septic tank is your settlement tank. It's separating your solids from your liquids. Uh, it's partially decomposing those solids. Any solids that don't decompose will stay in the tank and form that layer on the bottom, our sludge layer. And on our drainage field, you know, the effluent or waste is distributed throughout that drainage field. Um, the liquid waste gets further uh, sanitized or decomposed and disinfected in your soil. Uh, and your disinfected liquid waste can join the groundwater system at some point. The proper care of your septic tank is what's going to get your long-term operation of the drainage field. If you ignore the septic tank itself, it will cause issues with the uh, drainage field. We need to inspect our, our tanks regularly. We need to pump them on their schedules for operation. We don't want to flush anything that doesn't decompose quickly. And we you know, the, the replacement of these systems is expensive. Uh, a basic system can run up to about $25,000. And if you happen to be uh, falling under some of the, the Grand River Conservation Authority or other, other conservation authorities, these systems can go as much as $120,000 to $150,000. So it's important. And just because there is a regular tank in there now doesn't mean that when that goes, you can put another regular tank in there they may require you to upgrade to the newest codes, which can really drive the price up. So that's our septic system there. Um, did we have any questions there from uh, Jennifer? Um, only because this one's highly relevant. Um, one of our agents has, meant, has had mentioned that a triple tank system was in place. Um, is that the newest system, one of the newest types of systems out there or? It can be, yeah. There's, there's a lot of different types of systems and that, and that, like I said, to get in so in depth into those can take us two days. Uh, but a triple tank, um, it can be, uh, one of them is usually a, a finishing. So what you're doing basically is your first tank does exactly the same. The second tank can be used most times as a settling tank. Uh, it, 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 there's different variations of it. And the third generally will have some sort of a, a, a like a tertiary or, or a triple treatment, which could be sphagnum uh, or moss in there that has, has a, a bacterial culture in it that will consume more of the organics before it goes out to the, uh, the, the leaching field. So that, that could be it there. That might be why it's doing that. You can also have triple systems or double tanks if you have to pump the water if your field bed has to be raised like we talked about because the uh, soil doesn't drain enough, we may have to pump that up and you would have an extra tank for that as well. So there's, there's a lot of reasons that can happen and, and they have to be looked at on an individual basis. 
John, I realize there would be varying costs, but if you had to replace a complete system, approximately what price range would you be looking at? Uh, about 25000 for a regular system and up to 100000 120000 for a very complex system. And, and how like long, I said, right. No, and, and how long would, would generally speaking, uh, the life of a system be? That's a good question. About, usually about 35 years. Okay. Usually. If they're looked after, I've seen some that were 30 or 40 or 50 years old that still function. But you got to remember that generally those older houses, uh, you know, there's only one bathroom and it's usually an older couple living in there. Um, once you change over, you're going to cause some issues that may upset it and you may ha end up replacing it sooner than you think. Okay, Jennifer. Um, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> hey, what's this about cookies, Don? Sorry. <laughs> I'm totally distracted by the cookies. Yeah, we do. We make homemade cookies. My wife does. I'll make chocolate chip cookies that we usually drop off when we do presentations, but we're sending virtual cookies today to everybody. <laughs> the good news is they're gluten-free, keto-friendly, so you're good. So we have a question on whether or not to, uh, is it recommended to have a septic pumped prior to closing? But I, I guess you answered that question somewhat by saying, um, by get, I mean, if it has just been pumped, then there's no point in having it done again, correct? Well, uh, yeah, and if it's been pumped and it's been inspected, that's good. So I, I'm just, I have some stuff coming through here too. Um, if it's been pumped out recently and, and it's been inspected, then yes, that might be okay. Um, but then again, you know, most of them uh, before, uh, before the house closes, you're going to want to have that, uh, you're going to want to have that pump for sure because there's no other way to see the, 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 the tank and, and what the tank is doing. Uh, right. There's no way to tell what the condition of the tank is. Um, and, you know, just pumping, uh, I know sometimes that's what you get to do, but a pump and an inspection by somebody who knows what they're doing is always a good idea. Um, there's a couple of companies around that will do an inspection. They'll run water for an hour. They're going to watch the system. They're going to see how it's going. Um, there's another company, ESSE, um, and they're expensive, but my goodness, they do a good job. They run cameras through everything. They check everything over uh, so that we don't have to, uh, so that we don't have to, uh, you know, worry about what's going on. But uh, definitely you need somebody who knows what they're doing. And one final question on um, septic so that we can move forward. Uh, Toilet paper, you mentioned Costco. Uh, would you recommend using only um, identified septic friendly toilet paper? It's a good idea, but most of the, um, most of the toilet papers break down fairly well. Okay. Um, the reason I said Costco, I've had, I've, I've had issues personally with the Costco toilet paper. And those of you who don't know me, I'm actually a pulp and paper engineer. So paper is something that I know a lot about. Um, studied it for years. I'm also an environmental engineer. So the, these things all fit together, but there's a product they put in there. It's called wet strength. You want to keep the strength of the paper while it's wet for a certain amount of time for obvious reasons. Uh, if you don't know why, we'll talk about that offline. I don't think it's appropriate for now, but, um, and with the Costco, they put so much in there that it takes a long time to break down. And that's, that's what you got to look at. Triple plies and, and really, you know, uh, expensive toilet papers are going to cause issues. So I generally what I recommend anything that's on sale at uh, the grocery store, the, the cheap stuff. Okay, awesome. All right, um, what we can do everyone is um, print off the chat for Dawn later. And if there's any questions that we cannot get to because of time constraints, we will uh, we'll send them off if that's okay with you, Dawn. Absolutely. I'll take, I'll take some time. We'll answer them and then uh, I'll send it back and you can distribute it to everybody. It's, it's, it, questions are welcome. I, I really want, if there's something that, that's, that I'm not explaining to, to the point where, you know, you're understanding it, please ask because this is what we're here for. Perfect. Thank you. So go ahead. All right. Wells. Well, well, we're talking about wells. That's a deep subject apparently. We don't get any laugh. See, I can't hear you guys laughing. So it's kind of hard. Um, let's look here. So, uh, we're going to talk about water from the earth. Basically, we have to dig deep enough to reach the water table. What is the water table? It's where the soil and rock are saturated with saturated, um, and it's it's referred to as your water table there. 
Um, how how deep can that be? Well, if you're in Texas, uh, you can you can dig uh, to the water table with a teaspoon. Um, it can be it can be zero feet too. Like it it, it can be it, like a water table is your lakes. Your lakes are the water table, um, but they can also be hundreds and hundreds of feet deep. Um, some wells will be down as as far as four to five hundred feet in some areas. We don't worry about that too much in this area. We have good water tables, but yeah, it, 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 we we that that's why this is so important because these are can be very very expensive as well depending on what's going on underground. We have different types of wells, uh, uh, but we can have a dug well, hand dug, or, or dug with a machine. We have a bored well, um, and, and those are done with machines as well, um, or a drilled well, which is the most common that we would, we would find, and probably the better quality of water. And we're going to talk about each one of these. So a dug well, you know, they're dug by hand or, or with a backhoe. Uh, large diameter, three to six foot tiles, usually less than 30 feet. So the depth, uh, the depth before you're getting into a good water table is less than 30 feet. Um, these, these were very common. Um, that's what most older wells would be. I mean, we didn't have the technology to drill down and uh, get water from too far down. Um, so that's, that's what we see there. A board well is dug using machinery. So instead of being three or three to six feet wide, it'll be a two to two to three foot diameter. It can be a little bit deeper than a dug well, but usually less than a hundred feet. With a drilled well, we have a machine that's going to drill a deep hole, small diameter, six inches, and it can go down hundreds of feet to get to the water. So one of the things we people will ask sometimes is, how do you know where the water is? Sometimes it's luck. Um, you see guys going around; they, they call them. Uh, I think it, you know, I think it's called water witching. I'm not 100% sure. They can use a willow sticks or coat hangers, and these guys apparently can find water. I've seen it done. It's absolutely amazing. But sometimes it's just we know we're going to hit water eventually. So they just start drilling, and it, it, it can go down a long ways. So when you look at a drilled well, uh, so this is, sorry, this is where a water table is. So we want to get below the water table. And we're going to put a submersible pump in the bottom. These are your concrete sections. This would be a board well uh, or a hand dug well would work exactly the same. Um, important is to have a good cap on the top of anything. We don't want vermin. We don't want insects. We don't want dirt washing in there. And you see this little line along the edge here. And that's important because that's where it's not packed as well. So if, if we let water pool around here, sorry, we let water pool around here, it can actually migrate down the side of the well and contaminate our drinking water. This could be a drilled or bored well as well. Um, this one's a little different where they've actually put a grout in to seal it off to help with that. But you can see they, you're supposed to use a clay type soil on the top. You want to get everything flowing away. We don't want that water coming in. When you take the submersible pump up, where it tees to go into the house is generally about six feet underground. And the reason for that is we don't want it to freeze. So, uh, and you, well, we don't get frost that deep in most areas, but it's an Ontario type code. But it's also just because we don't get frost, it goes down, you know, five and a half, six feet. By driving over this line here with a, with a snowmobile or a ATV multiple times, uh, we can drive that frost right down that far. And it, and it does happen. Uh, I have seen water lines that were eight feet deep frozen uh, in Northern Ontario, of course, but from uh, snowmobile trails going over them. Uh, it just drives that, that, there's no insulation and it just drives everything down. When we get into these bored or drilled wells, we're generally getting through the bedrock layers. Uh, so it, we're, we're going a, a, a long way and you, your casing uh, will stop here. Uh, and this will be uh, open, uh, just drilled through the uh, drilled through the rock until we hit that water table. So the quality of water is important. I mean, we want to drink this water. We want to use it for 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 cooking. We want to use it for cleaning ourselves. Um, so the general rules are: surface water can be dirty. So anything that's on the ground, you're you know, if it, when it rains, you don't want to go in your backyard and, and with a straw and start drinking water. 
And why is that? Well, we got bugs, we have, you know, animal feces and we had uh, birds that, that, that might poop on the ground. Uh, you know, there, there's dead bugs, there's decomposing soil, there's decomposing grass. There's so many things that can be on it. So that surface water is dirty. When we hit that water table, like we talked about in the previous section with the septic systems, as water filters through the earth, the bacteria that's in or the, the microbes in the soil consume that bacteria that may be contaminating. So you get generally the deeper you go, the better the water quality is going to be. And that's why we don't want surface water getting into the well. And that's why this is so important to have that mounding to get everything away from the house, from that house, sorry. It's the same thing with landscaping, right? So I tell everybody at least three times a day to re-landscape around their house. So I'm, I, I got landscaping and houses uh, together. But, you know, getting, keeping, make sure that water's coming away from that casing so it doesn't migrate down and contaminate our clean water that's underneath. So we just talked about this. Your well casing uh, should be sealed as well. And that's what you see on this one here. What they've done versus the other, uh, the other photo we looked at, this one they've actually grouted this so that it's, there's, no, there's less chance of water migrating down to the water layer. Um, <clears throat> and and that's, that's one of the things we're gonna do to keep it clean. We're gonna keep the, the, everything away from going in. Um, so even if we avoid surface water, we can still get contamination from our septic systems, impurities in the soil, Contamination from other local sources, um, you know, th there's, there's areas in Cambridge that uh, had groundwater contamination from one of the old factories that was here. And, and, you know, that surface water would not be safe to drink. Another thing that gets in the water is radon. You can actually get radon gas dissolving into your water tables. And that's something that needs to be looked at. It's easy to fix, but it's something that should be looked at. And contamination from the septic system is important because that's why we have a rule of 50 to 75 feet from the septic tank to the well, any part of that system. We don't want that water to filter down because obviously we could have some contamination. Now, when, when we look at water quality, we can test for a lot of different things. And we should test it regularly. They recommend testing, uh, I think, bi-yearly right now uh, for bacteria, E. coli, and the, it, we're also doing it for the, uh, sorry, there's another one, uh, coliforms. So E. coli is a, is a fecal contaminant. Uh, and the, the other one, uh, coliforms, is generally from decaying insects. Uh, decaying plant matter will cause the coliforms to come up. There's, there's other testing really should be done, uh, depending where you are, with testing for impurities. You want to test for chemicals and fertilizers. Example, radon. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that a well water should be tested for. And maybe not as often as we test for the bacteria, but you know, looking at those things on a, on a biannual or annual basis is not a bad idea. And it's not a bad idea to, to do a, a little better test on the water uh, when people are buying houses. Uh, so they know if they have the farmer's field next door, you know, who knows if they you know, dumped uh, by accident or on purpose a, a, you know, a tanker load of fertilizer that got into your well, and that can make you very sick. The only way to test any of this is to send the samples to a laboratory. Um, <clears throat> laboratory testing is the only way to find any of this. Sometimes you can, certain things you can smell, uh, but for the most part, uh, we're gonna have a laboratory do that. So we wanna get this water into our house. Now we, we know we, we've got a well, um, we've got water in the bottom of the well, but now we need to get it into the house. So the well, basically the size of the casing will collect water. Now we have to pump it into the house. We have two ways to do that. Oh, well, only one way is to use a pump, but there's different types of pumps. Uh, so we can have a pump that's located in the house and we can have a pump that's located at the bottom of the well, referred to as a submersible pump. The pump located in the house is generally what we would call a jet pump. Which one's better? Well, for a deep well or shallow well, less than 25 feet deep, you can use a jet type pump inside of the house because you're drawing water up by suction. The deeper the water, the harder it is to suck the water out. So practically you're about 25 feet uh, is your practical limit in order to be able to get that water to suck out of the well. As we get deeper, oh, sorry, we'll show you a picture of one of the, this is an all-in-one system here. This is a jet pump. Um, you got the pump, the motor, 
and you've got your, your, your tank under here. And we'll talk about the tank in a bit. And it's a very important part of it as well. For a deep well, we're gonna use, the, the, the pump's gonna be in the bottom of the well. It's way easier to push water up than it is to suck it up. So um, you won't see a pump in your house. So that's, that's a good indicator of you know, what type of well is there. Just by walking through the basement and you look and there's no pump but there's a tank, well, it's probably a deep well. If we see a jet pump in the basement, then we know it's gonna be a shallower well. This is a, a, just an example of a, a, of a, a submersible pump. Um, you see here, you got your electrical on top and that electrical line runs all the way up along with a pipe to the top. So if you remember when we went back here, I'm gonna go back a couple. You look here, your, your, your wires will run along the, the outside of the pipe here. That pipe's gonna come up and go into the house. Now the size of the pump, uh, it depends on how deep it is. So you're going to need more horsepower to pump further. Um, and, and that's not something that, you know, uh, on a home inspection or any of us would be able to kind of look at and say, is that the right size pump? You're not going to see it anyway. Uh, but there are tests that can be done uh, on the electrical side to see if the pump is at the end of its life. Um, and there's a lot of testing that can be done on the well itself. The next part of it is our pressure tank. So the pressure tank's your reservoir. Well, what it does is it takes that that it evens out, we call it pressure, but it's really not pressure, it's flow. You want to even out the flow of water in the house. You don't want your flow to go up and down, up and down. And, and why would we want to do that? We, we don't want that because number one, you're not getting consistency to your water. Um, it's, it's just weird when you're trying to have a shower and it goes, you know, fast, slow, fast, slow. Um, so th there's a lot of reasons we want to do that. Um, but even, evening that out is good. And, it, and if we just had the pump at the bottom of the well, we had no reservoir tank, that pump would start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And, and that starting and stopping of the pump is hard on it. So in this, by, by doing this, we set our pressure tanks between 35 and 58 pounds. At 35 pounds, the pump turns on. At 58 pounds, it turns off. And that gives you some time in between the on off so that we're not going to overheat the pump and, and burn it out. The other thing is, you know, it doesn't come up to pressure and you get a whole bunch of water coming out and then it slows right down. We don't want that burst of water either. So it just makes it a little easier to use and it's going to make the equipment last a little longer. So generally, the type of tank we're going to see is one of these. And it's just a pressure tank. And these can be as small as eight inches in diameter uh, on some of the newer systems, uh, all the way up to, you know, being, uh, you know, two feet in diameter and four feet tall. I've seen some that were even bigger than that, depending on the capacity of the house and the type of well. So what types of problems do we run into with a well? Um, biggest one is water contamination. And the second one is running out of water. We cannot get, the well does not supply water fast enough for the use that we have in the house. Um, anybody who has sold a, a uh, country property or property with a well, one of the things that's usually asked for by the mortgage company is a flow test. And why do they want a flow test? They want to make sure that you have enough water in that house because running out of water in a house makes the house basically unlivable uh, by modern standards. And it's very hard to sell a house that doesn't have water in it. Uh, the way that's done is usually through a one hour flow test, measuring the, the, the volume of water coming out over a one hour period. Um, you know, I, I, if you would have asked me last year, I'd say, you know, usually it's okay, but I had two last week where we did flow tests on them. One ran out of water after 20 minutes and the other one ran out of water after 45 minutes. Uh, and that, and that's a huge thing. The one well is going to have to be replaced that it costs about $35,000. Um, and you know, so it's important that these things are looked at. Well water can run dry. Uh, you can have less well water when we don't have rain. Obviously, all that surface water eventually gets down. If we have long periods where we don't have rain, um, the water is not going to be refilling that well fast enough. Um, the other system thing that happens with these are failing of pump. The pump pump fails. You can't pump if the pump's not working. Pumps aren't really expensive. They're about fifteen to twenty five hundred dollars. But you got to remember that pump is on the end of a pipe that could be two hundred feet long. That's a lot of work to pull that two hundred feet of pipe and that 200 feet of, uh, of uh, power cable with it. Um, so that, that's something that a, a pro needs to get in and fix. 
pressure tank's not working properly, um, that's a very simple thing to diagnose in a house. If you open the tap and it goes fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, generally it's, it's the pressure tank that needs to be adjusted. It's not always the pump. Uh, it can be the pressure system. And just having it, these things need to be balanced every now and then. You know, we have a, we have a well with water in it. We have a pump at the bottom of the well for the most part or a pump in the house. We've got a pressure tank. You know, th these things all have to work together. Um, adjusting the pressure so that we're not running too high of a pressure so that, you know, the pump's not turning on at 20 pounds and turning off at 80 pounds. That's a big fluctuation in the, the flow of water that's going to happen in the house. We can also have, you know, the contamination here. Uh, so we talked about proximity of well to septic systems, uh, surface contours and stormwater. So getting everything away from that, a wellhead is very important. Uh, another thing that comes into that is buried wellheads. Sometimes, you know, you don't see the wellhead sticking out of the ground. And that wellhead should be sticking out of the ground a minimum of 16 inches. Sorry, you didn't lose me there. I apologize. My front door blew open. I just want to make sure that dogs didn't get out. Um, you know, what we can see, it, it, generally you'll find it as a, has an odor to it. Um, when we have a dug well or a board well where we have a cap on the top, there's always the possibility of contamination. Um, a lot of the older wells didn't even have a concrete cap on the top. They would build a wooden cover for them. Um, I've come across a couple of dozen wells in my time where, you know, animals have fallen into them. And that's very obvious what's going on. Um, contamination of the soil is, is, is one of the issues as well. Um, you know, we talked about different types of contamination from plants, uh, or sorry, indus industrial or, or, or um, you know, septic systems, or we have uh, heavy metals in the water or in the soil, which can leach in. So there's a lot of things that can happen there. So why can't the well supply water fast enough for the house? Uh, your pump can only pump as much as that, that filters back into the well. And, and that's one of the things that's important when you're looking at wells is, you know, flow test is, is a small little look at the, at what's going on, but looking at the recovery rate, rate of the well, which means if I pump that for an hour and my level goes down 20 feet, how long does it take for it to come back up that 20 feet to the static level? Uh, and that's, that's a really, that's a, a helpful indicator. Um, is, you know, we have here, if a family of four has, each has a shower, um, you shouldn't run out of water, but if you do, then that's, that's obviously an issue with the water levels in the well. Sometimes the bottom of the, of the well gets filled. Um, you'll get uh, contamination just from, the, not contamination per se in, in a bad way, but you'll have sand and, you know, small stones that can come into these wells and reduce the amount of water that's available and can actually limit the amount of water that's coming into the well as well. There's way too many wells there. So wells can run dry. It does happen. In this area, it's, it's not as, as prevalent. We have good water tables here. But if you take, you know, uh, an hour drive north or, or go, uh, you know, uh, out towards uh, Kingston area, they have a real hard time with water there. And they have a lot of houses that have wells and a cistern backup because they just they run out of water every year when it gets dry and that's simply that water table is not static that water table will move up and down depending on the seasons and how much groundwater is getting in so when your water level drops below the bottom of the well then we're in trouble the other thing that happened is your pump failure so your, your pump's mechanical um, when it's when it's in the bottom when it's in the bottom of the well, it's really hard to maintain that. Um, but there's some, you know, generally they'll run them to failure, um, and it's to be expected that a well will fail. And a lot of people ask, you know, how long does a well pump last? Well, it depends on the quality of the water. In hard, if we have really really hard water, they tend to not last as long because you get a little bit of scale built up around things, and there's more wear. But things that can also fail on a well system, you know, we have the piping can get a hole in it. If you're starting and stopping, that pipe moves a little bit every time. If there's, a, if there's something sharp, 
um, that wasn't removed, it can actually wear through the pipe and let some air in. Um, you know, gauges go a lot. So the, the, the pressure gauges need to be replaced. Your pressure switch can go bad. And that's the pressure switch is what, what tells the pump when to turn on at the low pressure and when to turn off at the high pressure. Motors go in them. Uh, for a jet pump, you can lose a motor. And the other thing that will, will fail is your pressure tank. Uh, you can get leakage on those. You can get water logging on those. So that's when that pump short cycles where you get that fast and slow, fast and slow. Um, and, and that, the, 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 the actual pressure tank itself is actually about 66% of it is air and only 33% of it's water. And that's what allows you to have that cycle shortened down. Uh, that, that water is incompressible. So you cannot compress water, but we can compress air. And that, that's the way we get more flow out of those. Pressure tanks rust out, especially in humid basements. If we have an older basement, uh, in century homes uh, where you got stone foundations, uh, you know, the, the tanks don't last as long because the outsides of them just rust right through. So how do we adjust these types of systems? You, have, you don't have a lot of uh, adjustments. You have a pressure switch. That's when it's gonna turn on and off. That's, that's the biggest thing you get. Um, you know, you can have short cycling that we've talked about numerous times. You can have a low pressure uh, scenario where, you know, you just, you got a, just a dribble of water coming out. That's not always a problem with, it could be a problem with the pump or it could just be that the pressure switches need to be adjusted because they're an open and close contact. And if they're not tightened up enough, sometimes they'll work themselves a little bit loose and you end up with, uh, with, with a pump that just only comes on at low pressure and turns off at low pressure. So you're, you know, you're getting only getting a dribble out of your taps. So in summary for wells, we have three separate types of wells. We have a dug well, we have a board well, and we have a drilled well. There are other types of wells that can be here as well, but these are the ones that, that are the primaries. In terms of water quality, we wanna reduce contamination wherever we can by keeping any contaminants away and testing our water regularly to make sure it's safe to drink. We have pumps. We can have a submersible pump for deep wells. We can have a jet pump or a, a shallow well pump. Uh, we have our pressure tanks, which is a bit of a reservoir for water, and, and it's there to smooth out the operation of the system. So we're not starting and stopping our pumps, which will cause you know, them to fail prematurely. There we go. Now we have question time. Thank you, Don. Um, I, I, I think um, one of the most relevant questions uh, is how and what is the best way to actually take a water sample to submit? Um, Good question. How, yes. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, really, um, yeah, I see lots of questions here. So um, taking a water sample, it, it's, it's not that hard. But the, for one of, there's a couple of different ways that people think about doing water samples. Um, the first way that, that is to take it from the tap and just go to the kitchen tap, take off your strainer basket, disinfect around it with an alcohol solution. Um, you can also use heat, but I'd rather see alcohol quite honestly, and run that until you're getting ice cold water, generally 10 to 15 minutes to get water from the well. You, you're taking it in your, your sample bottles, um, you're filling them to the line, do not shake your bottles when you're done it. You wanna invert the bottle up and down about 10 times to get the, there's a, thio, uh, a thione that's in the bottom to help preserve it. Um, and, and you fill it to the line, your thione, keep it cool, drop it off at the lab. That's the general way. But there's a few other things. Now that we have wells, uh, a lot of people are putting in uh, disinfection systems. And there's a lot of different ones. I've seen peroxide systems, I've seen hydrochlor hydro uh, bleach systems, excuse me. Um, and you want to make sure those are, are ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet lights to help kill bacteria. There's a lot of things that can be added before that tap. You want to make sure that you're taking your samples from the well. You do not want to be taking treated samples. So, you know, I get that question and a little put, bit of pushback sometimes. And why don't we want to take a treated sample? Because the treatment is working today, but if that well is contaminated and continues to, to be contaminated, it will eventually overwhelm 
the, the treatment systems. We want to know what we're bringing into the house. So my suggestion is unplug any treatment systems, run the system 15, 20 minutes, make sure you're taking it from a tap inside of the house that's used frequently and sanitize the tap, so the surface where the water comes out prior to taking your sample. Perfect, thank you. Jennifer, maybe one more question if there is one, otherwise, um, do you have one there? Um, you know, what, probably one of the best ones that is that has to be asked is what happens if the sample comes back with higher than higher than acceptable levels of E. coli, which you know most lenders are at zero. So, yep, good question. Um, so there there are fixes for that. Um, so the two types of contamination are your E. coli and your coliforms. Those are the two ones that the the health labs testing. So when you drop your sample off to the, the, the health unit, that's a free test. They're, they're testing that for free. They're only doing two tests on that. So if we come back with high E. coli, um, that's a contamination issue, and that can be serious. Um, what they would generally do, though, is treat the well with a – sometimes they'll use a, a bleach, usually a powder or a puck bleach. They let it sit in that water for an extended period of time, and then they pump the well out. Um, and then you let it run for a few days, use your normal water, and you take another test. And that's, that generally will clear it up for both coliforms and E. coli. Uh, but if it keeps reoccurring, then you have an issue with the, the, surf, the, the water table being contaminated. And generally, E. coli contamination will come from uh, farmer's fields or septic systems. Those are the two things that you usually get it from. Perfect. Thank you. We are out of time. We want to thank you so much um, for joining us today. We will have you back in a future Mindset Monday. Uh, and we will be sending you a list of questions that we can circulate the answers to afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be more than willing to sit on there. And uh, yeah, I would absolutely be willing to go through all the questions that are there. And, uh, you know, I'll make some, uh, make some notes on them. Thank you so much, Don. Thanks okay. everyone for joining us. Have a great week. And Thanks. thank you everybody. Bye. And I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Bye for now. Bye now.